So the Cold War is over. At least in 1991, people are operating under the assumption that the Cold War is over. Whether or not a new one is on the horizon, or if the first Cold War simply took an extended intermission and is starting to gear back up, that remains to be seen. All that aside, though, much of the 1990s ended up being a time of optimism for many Americans. Most of the world's socialist authoritarian states began moving towards democratic governments with capitalist economies, and those that did not were at least beginning to adopt a series of reforms that looked like progress to Western eyes. In China, for example, although pro-democracy movements was, were dealt a severe blow at the Tiananmen Square protests in 1989, those same protests arguably pushed the Chinese government to open up the economy more, as well as come down more harshly on corruption within government itself. Francis Fukuyama, an American political scientist popular at the time, famously argued that with the end of the Cold War, humanity had finally come to the end of history. According to Fukuyama and others like him, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of Soviet-style communism meant that the progression of human history as a struggle between ideologies was largely over, with the world settling on capitalist liberal democracy as the ideal form of governance and social organization. Since 1991, most have come to recognize that this prediction was probably a little too optimistic. Even if Fukuyama was, or potentially still is, right, ongoing wars over resources show that even if we have an, a global ideological consensus on how to best organize society, conflict can still come about because of other reasons, right? So history isn't really over. Fukuyama did not elaborate much on the future struggles that humanity might yet have to endure and how those struggles impact how people see and interact with wider society. Global climate change is a good example of an issue that the rival superpowers didn't really have to deal with much or worry about during the Cold War. What about other potential future challenges? What about rising trends in urbanization? What about pollution of the air and water, which aren't necessarily tied to industrial carbon emissions? What about automation, artificial intelligence, and income disparity? Since Fukuyama made his predictions, they've largely been discredited, but where does that leave us? Now that the Cold War is still fairly recently over, how do we face the future, not only as individuals, but as Americans? How about as human beings living together on Earth? Before we jump into the dis discussion too much, though, let's step back and take a look at our quote. This one is actually by George Washington, and he says, the heart of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respected stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions, whom we shall welcome to a participation of all our rights and privileges. It's important to understand that George Washington was likely really only referring to a specific group of people when he talks about immigration here, right? Educated, Protestant, white, West European men who were really only persecuted persecuted for advocating for American style democracy or uh, Christian Protestant beliefs, right? We would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that after the end of the American Revolutionary War, scores of escaped slaves jumped into Charleston Harbor to swim after departing British warships. America had not granted participation of all our rights and privileges to enslaved African people. So what do we make of immigration though, right? It's just one of many issues that Fukuyama overlooks when he declares this end to history. And it's not an issue that's just going to go away because the Cold War is nominally over. How should Americans address issues like this? For our discussion today, we're going to look at four major topics. We'll start by discussing the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA and the curb cut effect or more specifically, how changes like the ADA benefited not only the disabled, but everyone else as well. We should focus somewhat by stepping back and looking at other legal reforms taking place at the time. How do we as a society view social programs like welfare? How do we reform social programs to reflect modern needs? And how do we balance calls for aid with other concerns like budgetary issues? We'll build on our last lecture somewhat by discussing how the United States starts interacting with the rest of the world in the 1990s, specifically where and when the U.S. intervenes in international affairs and where and when it doesn't. 
And we'll wrap things up by discussing immigration, both economic immigration, as well as the migration of refugees seeking to protect their human rights. How has the US interacted with immigration in the past? And how does that contrast with debates over how we view immigration today? Let's take a quick second to remind ourselves of some things we've discussed so far this semester first. Since World War II, Americans working through the civil rights, feminists, and other social movements have worked to dismantle barriers preventing full participation by all people in American society. Structural systems and attitudes of racism, sexism, religious intolerance, and other forms of discrimination have, at least in general terms, become less acceptable as time has moved on. That being said, while efforts to close disparities along racial and gender lines have yielded mixed results, often in the form of de jure legal protections, injustice can persist when de facto structures of exploitation and oppression remain unopposed. Even then, race and gender do not constitute the only identities by which a person may be denied full participation and citizenship in a society. And lastly, of course, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States emerges as the world's sole superpower, meaning its global policies often went nearly unopposed by any potentially threatening geopolitical rivals. Our readings from last week spoke to this somewhat. How do we approach the international community now that America's weakest or greatest, sorry, geopolitical rival is gone? Something we've not talked about in class so far though are disability rights. So with that sizable omission in mind, I'd like to turn to a video that will tell us more about the subject. Growing up, we would talk about the American dream and work hard, study hard, and you could move forward. But if you had a disability, working hard and study hard didn't really mean you'd get anything. I went and applied for a daycare job to be a teacher's assistant. The teachers liked me, and then they found out that I had been in special ed, and all of a sudden the job was no longer available. My older brother uh, became deaf at a young age. I think he was maybe six years old. His life was circumscribed by people saying, well, you're deaf, so you can't do this, you can't do that. They told him he could be one of three things. He could be a baker, a shoe cobbler, or a printer's assistant. He said, I don't want to be any of that. They said, okay, now you're a baker. Ed just had a, a way of inspiring people to be what they needed to be. But he was a scared kid going off to college. It was just this terrifying idea, they're all going to look at me. And then he realized they could look at him and he could be a star. Of course, it opened the doors to people who had kids with disabilities. I wanted to be a teacher. My written, oral, and medical exam all were given in inaccessible buildings. And my friends carried me up and down the steps. And then I was failed on my medical exam because I couldn't walk, and I really couldn't let it drop. Friends of mine and I decided that what we would do is we would set up this group. I got a flyer in Braille, which I'd never received before. It said something like, fight for your civil rights. That was really the beginning of advocacy. I never knew that there was such thing as, you know, being proud of being a disabled person. It was everybody really beginning to demand respect and the right to be able to do with their life what other people do and don't have to think about. This one person said to me one day, you know, we got left out. I said, left out of what? He said, the Civil Rights Act. You can't discriminate against uh, people of color or women or sex or national origin, but disability, perfectly legal. I became aware then of a movement to have a broad civil rights bill to cover all people with disabilities. We had this wonderful point in time when we had the President of the United States strongly in back of it. We will not tolerate discrimination in America. I now lift my pen to sign this Americans with Disability Act and say, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. The biggest impact of ADA has been the change in the physical environment. Everything from curd cups to widened doors to seating in theaters. Buses are accessible. It means that people can actually get to their job. There's consciousness around accessible restrooms and hotel room doors. It has spawned a whole 
bunch of new technology. Portable respirators came out, motorized wheelchairs came out. Technology has transformed the lives of deaf individuals like myself. For those with intellectual developmental disabilities, technology is what allows them to participate. People with disabilities can work and can be a part of their community. You're seeing people with physical disabilities actually coming out to play high school sports. I gained a real understanding of the ADA and what it symbolized. We have the right to do everything and anything that we want, and it's because of the ADA. If my brother were alive today, I think now he would think that more people like him have a better shape, more fair shape. So beginning in the 1990s, the U.S. government instituted a number of long-awaited reforms that, be, that expanded opportunities for people who had previously been overlooked by the majority of society. The disabled specifically faced outrageous barriers to living their own independent and fulfilling lives. This was not because of a lack of their own ability, but because American society did not view accommodation as a priority for much of its history. In 1990, however, disability rights activists, civic-minded and grassroots organizations, and inclusive politicians worked to pass the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, which aimed to make social services, employment, and general participation in society easier for people with physical and mental disabilities. When we look at what the ADA specifically does, it's perhaps easier to divide the law into different titles and then explain what each title accomplishes. Title I of the ADA prevents discrimination in employment. Titles two and three ensure public accommodations, right? So being able to ensure that you can get to different floors on a building, that you can get inside the building itself. Title IV calls on telecommunications companies to provide services that help people with disabilities, such as touch tone phones. And Title V contains miscellaneous provisions like anti-retaliation laws, right? If you report an employer or a housing unit for not complying with the ADA, there needs to be assurances that you're going to be protected from them coming back at you. Now, the ADA was not universally agreed upon while it was drafted, right? Just as the civil rights and gender equality initiatives from years before have also faced pushback, so did the ADA. Detractors of protective legislation like ADA either bemoaned its economic cost or argued that the federal government just shouldn't have the ability to regulate things like public accommodation on principle. In spite of these detractors, however, many Americans soon learned about the ADA's largely positive, though sometimes unintended, effects on wider society. The idea that an investment in one group can cascade out and turn into a net benefit for folks beyond that target group that, that investment can provide for the broader well-being of a nation is known as the curb cut effect and it can be demonstrated in a variety of ways in the image here for example titles two and three of the ada require cut curbs at pedestrian intersections well, this move advantages people with disabilities people who have to rely on wheelchairs or other mobility devices to move around the benefit of cut curbs don't stop there right if you have a stroller if you're using a bicycle if you're riding a skateboard cut curbs uh, are just as beneficial uh, to you as well. But what other examples are there? In addition to protecting the rights of persons with disabilities to equal opportunity and accommodation, the ADA also provided sweeping protections for Americans with HIV or AIDS. Now we spent some time discussing the hurdles that folks with HIV or AIDS faced in addition to their diagnosis already, but it doesn't help to repeat some things either. If a person was discovered to have HIV positive status before 1990, they were often fired from their jobs. This meant they would usually lose their, lose their health care in the process, turning HIV cases that were medically manageable back into death sentences. Without equal housing or accommodation protections, HIV positive individuals could be evicted from their homes, just as mentally and physically disabled people could be too. People with HIV and AIDS had no recourse to fight this kind of discrimination prior to the ADA. So even though the ADA wasn't intended to address these issues, passing the ADA was still a huge benefit for people who were struggling with HIV and AIDS. This is another example of the curb cut effect. Just a few years after the ADA, more protective legislation went even further in providing for popular welfare and well-being. 
The Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, often just abbreviated as FMLA, required covered employers to provide employees with job protected and unpaid leave for qualified medical and family reasons. FMLA was originally intended to serve as a federally protected maternity paternity paid leave or unpaid leave system. A lot of countries have paid family leave systems in place, but the US didn't really have one before now, right? And FMLA isn't paid, it's unpaid. But like the ADA, FMLA had its own kind of curb, uh, cut curve effect. Since FMLA can be extended to other medical emergencies outside of, well, you know, giving birth, if someone is in a car accident and they can't walk, did they lose their job? Sometimes, but it happens much less often today than it did before 1993. And that's a big thanks to the regulations and protections outlined and established under FMLA. Now, at the same time as these reform efforts were being uh, drafted and were starting to gear up, other parties sought to pass reform that could be seen as contrary to social welfare and inclusion. Specifically, throughout the 1980s, criticism of how the US managed its social welfare programs grew increasingly more loud. As popular stereotypes like that of the welfare queen became central to public discourse on welfare. The Republican Party sought to rein in spending and continue the agenda of the Reagan and Bush administrations by advocating for a contract with America a series of legislative goals Republicans hoped to achieve in the 90s that would, among other things, shrink the size of government, lower taxes, and promote entrepreneurship. The best way they could do this, it was argued, was to end welfare as we know it, creating an almost entirely new social welfare system in the progress process. This new system needed to be cheap, and that meant imposing more strict limits and regulations on families asking for help from the government. Welfare recipients, it was argued, were trapped in a cycle of poverty and a system of dependency that disincentivized recipients from attempting to find gainful employment or save money to better their situation. After midterm elections in 1994, the Republican-controlled legislature passed two sweeping welfare reform bills, but they were both vetoed by then-President Bill Clinton. Clinton agreed to negotiate with Republicans on welfare, though, and in 1996, a comprehensive reform bill was eventually signed into law. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996 did effectively end welfare as Americans knew it. Among the provisions contained in the contract, the reform law gave states a greater say over how social welfare programs ran, it was not federally directed anymore, it introduced sweeping requirements on welfare eligibility, it made it harder to get welfare aid. And it also set lifetime terms of five years for receiving benefits. So no matter what the economic situation was, if you have already received some sort of welfare, social welfare benefit for a total of five years, you are no longer eligible, period. Sometimes abbreviated as the PRWORA, um, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act has a mixed legacy. Its advocates argue that the law reasserted America's work ethic. But detractors point out that only the number of recipients on welfare changed while actual employment and poverty rates did not. Whether or not someone views the welfare reform law as successful or not kind of depends on how they define success. If the goal was to improve living standards, then welfare reform really didn't accomplish much. But if the goal was more to remove how many people could request government assistance, how many people could have access to welfare, well then, the reform was a huge success. The last reform I've heard of the 1990s that we should really address today concerns health care. Now, as you all may already know, the United States is essentially the industrialized nation that does not have a government-run health care or health insurance program. Debates around the potential for universal healthcare in the United States date a long ways back, back into the 1940s and before, when the US was still struggling and beginning to emerge from World War II. In many European countries, impoverished citizens could not afford to pay for healthcare on their own after World War II had ended, as many livelihoods had been destroyed during the war. And you may recall, post-war economic recovery was slow. This lack of accessibility led many Europeans to demand universal health care from their governments. In the United States, however, post-war prosperity meant that few people were going 
without health care. So demand for health care reform just wasn't very high. Now, the idea of a national health insurance was incredibly popular before World War II's end. FDR, who was elected to four terms as president and died only a few months before the end of the war, wanted to capitalize on post-war prosperity by passing a series of constitutional amendments that he groups together as a second Bill of Rights, or sometimes referred to as the Economic Bill of Rights. Support for these reforms soured though, and especially after the Red Scare of the 1950s, many of these asks just seem too socialist for a more conservative-minded America, and debates about passing them didn't get very far. Now, healthcare in the United States has historically been funded by employers as a means to keep people working for their company, so they wouldn't want to move and work for somewhere else. These kinds of perks were initially seen as fringe benefits, but the growing power of the labor movement in the 1930s and 40s meant that more Americans were able to demand health care coverage from their employers, even though they didn't belong to some elite white collar professional class, right? If you want us to work at your factory, you have to give us health care. Otherwise, we'll go work at a factory that offers it when you don't. With the decline of the labor movement and deindustrialization, however, fewer employers were willing to offer adequate health care in the form of employee compensation. In countries that have established government run health care systems, deindustrialization didn't have this effect because health insurance wasn't tied to employment. It was just seen as a human right. Now, it's worth pointing out that debates around health care in the United States are contentious, and whether or not someone supports reform usually depends on what role they think government should play in the everyday lives of its citizens. Critics of universal health care have been quick to point out that in societies where health care is a given, medical care is often of lower quality than in the United States. When comparing the United States and Western Europe, for example, the U.S. has a longer life expectancy and experiences fewer incidents of infant and maternal mortality. Advocates of reform counter that a sizable percentage of bankruptcy, foreclosure, and small business failure rates in the U.S. stem from medical bills and health care costs, something citizens in countries that health care provide, they just don't have to deal with that, right? So specific data used in arguments against health care reform also comes under criticism too, right? How are some of these averages calculated? How are outliers in data dealt with? Depending on how you can present data, you can infer, you can, uh, you can provide different assumed conclusions with data based on how you're presenting it, right? Based on how you calculate percentages and averages. If you're taking like statistics or econ classes, this becomes pretty apparent too. Huge campaigns by pharmaceutical industries and for-profit hospitals were waged to defeat reform efforts in the 1990s. And when Barack Obama ran for president in 2008, he campaigned on health care reform, and he ran into similar resistance. Initially, Obama wanted to either institute a national health service or provide Americans with a government-run public option that would be available to all Americans in case they could not afford more expensive private plans. Opposition to reform proved to be too great for the Democratic Party, however, and in the end, a less ambitious bill was eventually passed. We know this bill as the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, which is different from the ADA. You might also hear it being referred to as Obamacare. Obamacare did achieve a number of smaller reforms that reformers like Hillary Clinton had failed to achieve in the 1990s. For example, it drastically improved the lives of Americans by allowing adults under the age of 27 to stay on their parents' health care plans. And it set laws that prohibited private insurance companies from dropping their clients when they developed illnesses and other medical problems. The ACA is still contentious though, and the Republican Party has campaigned on repealing the ACA since its passage. How much say should the government have over personal issues like healthcare? That's a subjective question. And the answer you give really depends on your views. Contextualizing these debates around reform, federal spending, and the role of government represented growing concerns for folks who were worried about America's national debt, or the sum of all debt owed by the federal government to other governmental bodies and public holders of treasury securities. The national debt is an outcome of a widening national deficit, or annual budget imbalances and shortfalls that accrue over time. 
Reaganary tax breaks, corporate subsidies, and other financial stop gaps adopted at the end of the 1970s and start of the 1980s, you know, basically to, to deal with recession, to deal with stagflation. These tax cuts contributed to a deepening annual national deficit. As these deficits continued to add up throughout the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, more people became increasingly concerned about the national debt. In order to maintain the national debt and avoid a credit default, a greater proportion of the U.S. economy needs to be allocated to paying the interest of the national debt each year. Today, approaches to dealing with the national debt fall under three basic strategies. First, the government could decrease spending. This would involve cutting services and relief programs in order to balance the budget. Taxes can't be raised since doing so in a globalized economy might mean capital flight out of the United States and just greater job loss. Or number two, the government needs to increase taxes, specifically on corporations and the rich, in order to balance this budget. Taxes have already been lowered throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even in the 2000s. And lowering them to irresponsible levels, and that's just uh, seen as, yeah, it's just seen as irresponsible, right? Lowering them further just might bring about an infrastructural collapse in the country. If we can't afford to maintain things like roads, uh, what's our economy going to look like? And then the third approach is usually some combination of the two uh, above, right? We need to raise taxes and reduce services, maybe. Again, how you view these kinds of issues really depends on how you see the world and view national priorities. Can America afford to spend money on popular welfare and social uplift, or is the price tag too great? Remember that these specific issues might not seem that exciting to you as a voter, but that doesn't necessarily mean folks who, viewed, who hold views contrary to your own aren't incredibly interested in these kinds of debates. So we spent some time talking about domestic reform. After the Cold War, national optimism led to some major changes being adopted, but at the same time, some of those Cold War fears could still prevent other kinds of reform. Let's turn now and look at things internationally, right? As the Cold War was beginning to wind down, Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein launched an invasion of Kuwait, a smaller country to the south, and annexed that country as Iraq's newest province. Iraq used to have 13 provinces, now it's annexing Kuwait and it has 14, right? Saddam didn't win the Iran-Iraq war, and after he agreed to a stalemate with Iran, he didn't enjoy a lot of popularity at home. Saddam hoped that by annexing a small country like Kuwait, he could improve his image and reinvigorate Iraq's war-torn economy. Now, while Kuwait is a small country, it also sits on top of massive oil reserves and is well positioned for international shipping. Iraq's shipping situation, as you might be able to tell from this map, is a little precarious, however. So that also could be greatly improved by uh, Iraq annexing Kuwait, right? It's not as easy to cut off Iraq's shoreline if you just increase it by five times. Members of the United Nations met in response to Saddam's invasion of Kuwait and warned that if he didn't withdraw from the country, the UN would have to intervene to force him out. All of the countries voting on the resolution that declared uh, all of the countries voting on the resolution that declared this, only two countries opposed the measure, and that was Cuba and Yemen. The USSR, which technically still existed at the time, supported it in a rare show of cooperation with the United States. Most of the Gulf War was an air war, meaning that fighting was largely one-sided and took the role of bombing campaigns and other flying sorties or missions. From January until late February, the United Nations coalition had attacked positions in Kuwait and Iraq, paying special attention to surface-to-air missile sites, or mobile SAMs, which Saddam was using to shoot rockets at Saudi Arabia and Israel. By the end of February, Iraqi troops were deserting from their units, and many had surrendered to Allied forces. Saddam finally agreed to withdraw from Kuwait and accept the UN resolutions, officially ending the war on March 1st, 1991. While Saddam was driven out of Kuwait, some American commentators and politicians argued the U.S. should continue into Iraq and forcefully remove Saddam from power. These goals were not in the original U.N. declarations, though, and that ultimately meant that 
this push to remove Saddam didn't get very far. Ultimately, Saddam was able to remain in power. Politicians defended the decision not to invade Iraq by arguing that it would bog down U.S. troops in a quagmire like what happened in Vietnam. Critics of the decision to leave Saddam in power felt vindicated when Saddam's army began committing genocide against that country's Kurdish minority. The Kurds and many Shia Muslims had supported the UN by rebelling against Saddam during the war. When the United Nations withdrew, those uprisings were crushed. Saddam infamously employed mustard gas on his own people in order to defeat the Kurdish rebellion in the north, a crime that the United Nations did little to condemn. In the United States, the Gulf War, though, was seen as a major foreign policy success. George H.W. Bush, the older one, who himself had been a pilot in World War II, looked at the success in Iraq and is claimed to have stated, quote, by God, we finally kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. The Vietnam syndrome, you may recall, was the name given to the attitude of American citizens who, after seeing losses in the Vietnam War, were incredibly reluctant to commit U.S. troops to other foreign conflicts. This is why you don't see a big America fighting a big war in the 1980s. We tended to shy away from wars in the 80s. Uh, we just financed wars uh, that we ourselves didn't get involved in. So the, the wars in Southern Africa and Zimbabwe and Angola, the wars in Nicaragua, oh, the Americans didn't fight those because of the Vietnam War syndrome. They did finance them though. While American success in Iraq led many to celebrate, the U.S. was also faced with other foreign policy issues that it handled with different degrees of success throughout the 1990s. In 1994, a civil war in the small African nation of Rwanda escalated into a full genocide when radical militias overthrew the government and began massacring political opponents and ethnic minorities in the country. This is known as the Rwandan Genocide. After the assassination of Rwanda's president, the country's Hutu majority launched an ethnic cleansing campaign against the nation's smaller Tutsi minority. For more than two months, Hutu militias were able to kill Tutsi people without any retaliation to speak of. Different Tutsi organizations and refugee groups tried to pressure the United Nations to act, but no action ever came. Eventually, Tutsi groups from outside Rwanda launched an invasion of the country with truly only the most minimal amount of help and support from France and the genocidal government finally collapsed. Between a half a million and 1.1 million Tutsis were killed over the course of those two months, however, and many have since condemned America as the nominal leader of the free world for not taking a greater interest in ending the genocide. While well, Rwanda today is a democratic and pluralistic country, the scars from the genocide are still visible, and the militias that carried out the atrocities are still active in neighboring countries like the Congo. The lack of a response to the genocide in Rwanda seemed to delegitimize the promises that were made at the founding of the United Nations, promises that never again would a genocide be allowed to happen. The following year, in 1995, the government of Yugoslavia invaded the country of Bosnia after it had declared its own independence. In order to reassert control over the country, Yugoslavia kicked off the Bosnian genocide, hoping they could prevent Bosnia's separation from Yugoslavia if they could kill enough Bosnian Muslims who supported independence. In response to the genocide in Bosnia, the US and other NATO members began a bombing campaign of the country until the government relented and agreed to allow Bosnia to become an independent nation when they signed the Dayton Accords in Ohio. The US and NATO would go to war with Yugoslavia again in 1999 when the Yugoslav government employed similar ethnic cleansing tactics against Albanians fighting for an independent Kosovo. You can see Kosovo on the map there, kind of bottom center. As a result of the US and NATO actions, the Yugoslav government was again pushed back before collapsing in 2000. While the genocides in Bosnia and Kosovo were effectively stopped through American-led international cooperative efforts, Critics were quick to point out that U.S. foreign policy was slow to help impoverished people outside of Europe who had few natural resources to barter with, right? So we protected Kuwait, we protected Bosnia and Kosovo, but it's because they either had oil or were in Europe. What about Rwanda? These kinds of debates bring us back to 
how we should define America's role in the world, right? Is it, is it up to America to protect international human rights? Or is this something the UN should be responsible for? Is it fair for the US to wipe its hands of global problems when oftentimes in history, the foreign policy of the United States helped create those problems in the first place? Who's to say? It can be a nuanced and tricky issue. This actually brings us in a roundabout way to the September 11th attacks. Now, I personally can vividly recall where I was when I learned about the attacks, but I don't know how much you all recall. I want to spend some time talking about 9-11 more when we have our next class discussion, but until then, it's worth discussing some basic facts about 9-11 so we can all come to that discussion more or less on the same page. Now, international reactions to the September 11th attacks were almost uniform in their condemnation. Nations like Cuba and Iran, historical adversaries of the United States, expressed their grief in calling for justice and retribution. This almost unparalleled degree of international cooperation meant the US government and global security agencies were able to discover the perpetrators of the attacks very quickly. The fundamentalist group Al Qaeda, which was headed by a Saudi Arabian multimillionaire named Osama bin Laden, were found ultimately responsible. Now, Al Qaeda was an international organization, but most of its leadership and members were headquartered in Afghanistan. Al Qaeda was given refuge by the Taliban, Afghanistan's extremist government, after they took over most of the country in 1993. You may remember that both the Taliban and Al Qaeda originated as splinters of the US funded Mujahideen. This is one example, albeit a soul crushing one, of how short term US policy short-term U.S. foreign policy can come back with unintended consequences, right? We funded the Mujahideen to fight the Soviet Union and kick them out of Afghanistan, uh, but then the same weapons and training we supplied the Mujahideen with were used to uh, hijack planes and fly them into buildings. The U.S. government ordered the Taliban to turn over Osama bin Laden and other high-ranking Al-Qaeda officials and to allow NATO and the United Nations to enter the country so members of Al-Qaeda could be brought to justice. The Taliban government refused though, so the United States and its NATO allies responded by invading Afghanistan in October of 2001, just a month after the 9-11 attacks. This invasion and the resulting occupation were named Operation Enduring Freedom, though we most often reference the war in Afghanistan when discussing American involvement there. Operation Enduring Freedom has since become America's longest running war. While well, American involvement in Vietnam lasted for about nine years, give or take a year, depending on how you define involvement, the U.S. is still involved in the war in Afghanistan, which is nearing 20 years old this year. Operation Enduring Freedom, well, ultimately unable, or not ultimately, well, initially unable to capture Osama bin Laden, which was its goal, the invasion of Afghanistan led to a collapse of the repressive Taliban government and the instatement of a multi-party democratic government. And it also, you know, it provided for a severe disruption of Al-Qaeda's activities in the country. So those were good things that came out of it, certainly. After initial success in the war of Afghanistan, sources close to the president, who is George W. Bush, the younger one at this time, sources close to the president began to grow concerned with the potential of, nucle of a nuclear weapons program that might have been underway in Saddam's Iraq. So this is about 12 years after the first Iraq war, the Gulf War, the invasion of Kuwait, about 12 years after, people are going to the younger Bush and saying Saddam might be developing nuclear weapons. While different countries pursuing nuclear weapons had not been so controversial in a pre-9-11 world, after the September 11th attacks, many national security specialists and advisors to the president warned that, quote, the next smoking gun might be a mushroom cloud. This was a phrase, a turn of phrase that was used pretty often at the time. With more specialists arguing that Iraq might develop a nuclear weapon soon, and with Saddam's history of using weapons of mass destruction against his political opponents and ethnic minorities, Bush came under increasing pressure to address the issue soon. While most Americans agreed that Saddam was a dictator and Iraq could benefit without him, Many were not convinced that Iraq posed an imminent threat to the United States, and several investigations by the UN failed to turn up substantial evidence that Iraq was developing nuclear weapons at all. In March 2003, however, Bush ordered the invasion of Iraq after Saddam refused to leave the country. 
about a week before uh, the invasion, Bush got on international in the international press and on TV, and he ordered Saddam to step down and for his family to leave Iraq, and Saddam refused. And this kicks off the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the second Iraq war. Now, the U.S. military saw quick success in Iraq, like they experienced in 1991. And, you know, both times when they were fighting against Saddam's forces, there was a pretty big power disparity there. In addition to that, many of the military just were not loyal to Saddam, and they either surrendered or just abandoned their posts once fighting began. Crowds in metropolitan cities like Baghdad, Basra, and Mosul were jubilant at first, and Iraqi citizens gathered in city squares to pull down statues of Saddam and celebrate the collapse of his dictatorship. As time dragged on, however, many Iraqis continued to go without food, water, and electricity as occupying U.S. forces ran into considerable roadblocks to restarting the Iraqi economy and returning Iraq's standard of living to its pre-war high. Sunnis, some of whom remained loyal to Saddam, began to form militias and take up arms against the occupying U.S. forces. At the same time, those same militias began fighting with rival Shia militias as Iraq began backsliding into a civil war. Saddam was ultimately captured in December of 2003 and was subsequently executed in 2006 by hanging. By the time Bush left office in 2008, he faced substantial international criticism, both for failing to still capture Osama bin Laden and also for starting the 2003 Iraq war, which had become incredibly unpopular. So how do we view American involvement in the world? There seems to be a consensus that the invasion of Afghanistan was justified, but that Iraq's wasn't. Why is this? Is it just because the US was attacked by people in Afghanistan, but not by people in Iraq? But what about the nature of Saddam's dictatorship and his use of weapons of mass destruction? When is it okay for the United States to attack a country and when is it not okay? It's worth mentioning that Americans never found any nuclear weapons, but that doesn't mean that Saddam wasn't still a dictator, right? Does that legitimize the invasion of Iraq? If it does, what other crises is the U.S. beholden to respond to? If it doesn't, then when should the U.S. intervene in global affairs and when should it refrain from getting involved in things? You can see that these aren't always easy questions with straightforward answers. For that matter, American invention can lead to humanitarian crises when it's, there, when it's not handled delicately. In 2011, at the start of the Arab Spring, the US and its major European allies became directly involved in the Libyan and Syrian civil wars, leading to massive humanitarian and refugee crises. And I say crises because there were two, right? It wasn't just Syria. There was a huge crisis in Libya that developed after the fall of their dictator, Muammar, uh, Muammar Gaddafi. If the U.S. helps start, or just starts, a war, even if the pretense is to protect human rights, does the U.S. take on an obligation to help solve those crises? What should America's commitments be to people who are not American citizens? Let's take a turn and spend some time looking at immigration. Not just refugee immigration, but immigration in a more general sense. I'm reminded of that quote we started the lecture with here, the one by George Washington. The heart of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respected stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions, whom we shall welcome to a participation of all our rights and privileges. Now again, it can be certainly argued, and I think correctly so, that Washington had specific groups of individuals in mind when he made this statement, but it's also worth pointing out that the United States did not enact any immigration laws until 1881, meaning that for more than the first hundred years of American history, there were no restrictions on immigration. The US actually, this actually served the United States very well by keeping an open immigration policy, craft workers, artisans, and specialists from other countries were able to come to the US more easily, bringing their expertise and skill with them. Immigration restrictions that did exist were largely made with the intent of limiting immigration from countries deemed undesirable. The first immigration law, for example, was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited immigration from China, Japan, and other East Asian nations. In 1924, the U.S. formally adopted a national immigration 
system that favored specific racial and national groups by limiting the number of immigrants allowed entry into the United States through national origins quota. This system ensured that smaller non-white communities would not outgrow America's predominantly white demography. Essentially, these first immigration laws ensured a system of continued white supremacy. These restrictions could be overlooked for economic benefit, however, and a good example of how this was done can be seen in the Bracero program. When the US joined World War II, it faced a severe manpower shortage, right? This is why women began winning access to well-paying well -paying manufacturing work in the defense industry. And in terms of food, the US was incredibly worried that these same labor shortages might harm the country's agricultural production, which was essential to winning the war, right? You can't feed troops if you aren't growing food. The US government sought to remedy this situation by coordinating with Mexico to establish the Bracero program. Braceros, a uh, term meaning manual labor or one who works with their hands, and vaguely translated, were migrant workers who were temporarily allowed to come to America to work in agriculture. Paid 30 cents an hour, about $4 an hour today, the Bracero program promised to provide Mexican workers with housing, proper sanitation, food, and additional funds for remittances for when they returned to Mexico. U.S. officials hoped that the program would help maintain food production while keeping food prices low, even though the ongoing wartime labor shortage allowed other non-agricultural workers to argue for unionization and greater compensation. This was not true of agricultural workers. They were not allowed to unionize at this time. Despite these controls, which aimed to limit the worst abuses faced by Mexican, American, and other migrant farm workers, most growers ignored them through a number of workarounds. These were often illegal, but local law enforcement could be bribed to look the other way. Workers could still be underpaid, housing and basic accommodations were slow to improve, and there were few legal protections. And even though those legal protections were provided on paper, they rarely prevented retributive violence. Racist and anti-labor lynching of migrant farm workers was so pronounced that during World War II, Mexico actually refused to send refused to send Bracero workers to the state of Texas until the federal government addressed ongoing racial violence there that was directed at Mexican migrant workers. During this same period, the Zoop Suit riots broke out in Los Angeles, which was a racial, uh, a racist riot targeting uh, Mexican immigrants, Mexican migrant workers, and Mexican American GIs and other Latin American uh, workers as well. In addition to the Bracero program failing to address the needs of migrant workers, many growers continued paying porters to bring undocumented workers across the US-Mexico border. This is actually a long running practice that dates back to the 1800s. Growers would pay to have agricultural labor imported over the border because undocumented workers do not benefit from labor, wage, or basic legal protections. And attempts to report abuse usually end with the deportation of the worker and the family separation that comes with that. Well, the grower usually doesn't usually doesn't face uh, too many consequences too many consequences outside of a slap on the wrist. After the war, despite its shortcomings, the federal government continued the Bracero program as a way to improve the incomes of Mexican workers through remittances, which the U.S. believed might help prevent the rise of communist organizations in Mexico. Once it was clear that. Such groups actually didn't pose that much of a threat to Mexico's security though. The US government began deporting undocumented workers back to Mexico through the INS's Operation Wetback, which began in 1954. Now the Immigration and Naturalization Service or INS uh, was more or less the precursor to today's Immigration and Customs Enforcement or ICE or ICE. The INS began mass deportations as post-war economic growth began to slow, and these deportations affected not only undocumented workers from outside the Bracero program, but also migrants who were in the U.S. legally or were even U.S. citizens, but simply lacked the documentation to prove so. In the first year of Operation Wetback, over one million workers were deported to Mexico, and by the time the operation came to an end, these deportations amounted to over 3.8 million people more than 2% of the US population. Many of these workers that were deported were US citizens and there remains a legacy of anger and resentment in the American Southwest, Southwest as many quote unquote illegal immigrants there today can actually trace their 
ship back to, through uh, oral genealogies, even if they lack the necessary documentation to prove that. In addition to the idea of illegal immigrant being used to criminalize people who are really only here trying to seek a better life, people prefer undocumented because, as it turns out, a lot of undocumented workers are U.S. citizens. They just don't have the documentation and are therefore subject to deportation. Following Operation Wetback, labor shortages in the agricultural industry led the federal government and growers to cooperate on a program known as the A-Team. This isn't in the slide because you don't need to know this, but the A-Team is an acronym that stood for Athletics in Temporary Employment as Agricultural Manpower. The expectation was that college and high school athletes would work as migrant workers over the summer, helping boost agricultural output. The program launched in 1965 and included more than 18,000 17-year-old high school students who were sent to work on farms in Texas and California. Many students quit working and either returned home or staged sit-ins over oppressive working conditions. The A-Team program was canceled after just one summer. In 1965, the year after the Bracero program was officially terminated, the U.S. government passed and signed the Hart Seller Immigration Act into law. Hart Seller abolished the previous national origins formula that governed U.S. immigration, but re-entry into the United States remained out of reach for many foreign nationals who wanted to come to America in search of a better life. Since Art Seller's regulations regarding immigration have changed, at times immigration has become more inclusive, but as we come closer to the present day, these changes are often more limiting towards legal immigration methods than they are helpful for immigrants and refugees alike. The Refugee Act of 1980 made it possible for refugees and other persecuted individuals and groups to request asylum in the United States, for example. Less than 20 years after that law passed, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996 placed limits on immigration with the intent of preventing terrorism. So if you are escaping a violent country where there are murders and death squads, you can apply for asylum, but it is very likely your asylum will be denied because you might be a member of a death squad or a murderer. The Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996 that welfare reform law we discussed earlier, made sure that most forms of public assistance and welfare were closed off to documented immigrants, even if they ended up becoming naturalized citizens. The Enhanced Border Security and Visa Entry Reform Act of 2002 and the Real ID Act of 2005, meanwhile, placed even more limits on immigration and expanded the process for expedited deportations. Now, you may have noticed that a lot of these newer immigration restrictions come in response to fears of terrorism. But it's also worth pointing out that few terror attacks carried out in America were ever perpetrated by undocumented workers. We're going to be coming back to discuss terrorism next week, focusing on who commits terrorism in the United States and why. But until then, keep this fact in mind. Most terrorists come to the United States legally if they even have to come to the United States in the first place. So why are fears of terrorism and undocumented workers associated with one another? Remember to critically ask these types of questions. Who benefits from that discourse? So that's actually going to take us to the end of today's lecture. Uh, by the end of the week, so that's June 25th, uh, you know, by the end of the day on Friday, make sure that you've posted two responses to uh, two of the four discussion board prompts, right? Just those two, the other two you don't necessarily have to, you don't have to respond to unless you really uh, feel compelled to. With it being the end of the semester, I completely understand if you don't, uh, that's not a requirement, but make sure that you are still uh, contributing to these discussion board responses, that you're making replies to your classmates' responses and you're continuing to have some of these uh, constructive and respectful conversations about some of these core historical issues with each other. I'm certainly going to keep looking forward to reading these discussions. Uh, I think a lot of everyone's comments thus far have been remarkably insightful. Uh, so keep it up. The end of the semester is almost here. Um, so, you know, I understand that sometimes at the end of the semester, things can kind of like drag on. You're just like, oh, let it, let it end, right? But uh, everyone has been doing um, really amazing work this semester. So, uh, so keep that up. Uh, the readings, uh, the last set of readings that we're going to have for the semester, um, we have a chapter in our textbook, that's chapter eight, the last one. Uh, 
kind of brings us more or less up to the current day, minus uh, the you know a couple of years that we've just come out of. Um, it bring it's pretty recent. It ends on a pretty recent note. There's also two uh, articles. Uh, the first isn't really an article. It's more of an op-ed. It's an opinion editorial that was published in the Nation. Uh, it's about the American Empire, and you know, is it falling apart? The author seems to think so. What do you think, based on uh, your historical understanding, what you've learned from this semester, your own observations? What do you think the the future holds for us? Is the American Empire in decline, or are we just kind of going through a slump like we did in the 1970s? Who's to say? And also we have uh, a second article. This is by uh, CSIS. It's a Center for Strategic Intelligence about uh, the escalating terrorism problem in the United States, right? How do we confront terrorism and the threat of specifically domestic terrorism while also respecting the individual and political rights and freedoms of, of individuals? All these conversations, all these questions, you know, they're going to seem very nuanced and difficult to approach. And it's just because they are, it's not just you. Uh, so if you're not really sure 100% how we tackle these issues, that's fine. Um, I think anyone who can jump right into a problem and, and say definitively, this is how you solve something is really missing a lot of the nuance and a lot of the complications that surround a lot of issues today, right? There's, there's reasons that so many of these problems remain unsolved. Uh, but, you know, if you are engaging with those specific discussion board posts relating to some of these articles, um, do your best. And don't forget to kind of maintain historical empathy with people that you might not necessarily agree with. Uh, it's important to at least understand where um, what people's anxieties are and where, where they're coming from. Of course, we have our fifth extra credit uh, re film review available. That's going to be due also on Friday, June 25th. Um, it's a uh, it's actually a pretty recent documentary. It was published in 2017 by NPR, and it's about a standoff with ranchers uh, out in uh, out west between uh, ranchers and the federal government, and kind of like the struggle over land rights and land usage, and how much the federal government should have, and how much the federal government should be able to interfere with uh, with independent ranchers, um, small businesses what kind of role the government should have. So if that is something that's particularly interesting to you, or if you're not necessarily, uh, if you're a little uncomfortable with where your grade's at, um, that's an option that uh, completing that extra credit opportunity will, will help bump your grade up a little bit. So don't be afraid to take advantage of that. Um, and also just a reminder that our zine final projects, these creative zines that we've been putting together, these are going to be due by the end of the day, Tuesday next week. That's June 29th. Make sure you have them in by 11.59. I'm usually pretty lenient with uh, with due dates. Um, I'm usually pretty lenient with accepting late work, especially if students ask for like uh, extensions. I can't really be with, uh, with this assignment just because uh, department regulations require me to submit final grades for the course pretty quickly after we take our final exam. Um, so make sure you're getting these zines uh, into me on time, so I'm not be so I'm not forced to load up a grade that doesn't include your final project, right? If you are running into problems getting things in on time, please please reach out to me ahead of time so we can work something out. Um, but yeah, it also just in addition to that, just a general reminder um, to keep your eye on that due date. A lot of times due dates show up a lot sooner than we expect. Uh, so just a yeah. Also, if you do have any general uh, questions. If you need any help with this assignment, I am always uh, accessible either by Canvas message or through emails. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out. I'm always, as your instructor, I'm always here to help uh, with anything uh, in any way that I can. Um, so, you know, the Wayne State has library resources. We have archive resources. Think of your instructor as a resource too. I'm here to help you. So uh, don't be afraid to self-advocate. Reach out to me if you need any assistance and I'll happily help you any way I can.